so for you, I'm interested to know, how do you want people, what would you really want people to say about Dave the man? Like what, what, what is it that you want people to say about you? Um, now, not when you die, like right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, my flip answer is I don't, I don't, um, that doesn't animate me. Like, I don't care if they think about, you know, me, I just care about, you know, and to me, like, you know, the, the second most um, translated book, right, is The Purpose Driven Light. It starts with, it's not about you. Yeah. Um, but I guess it would, I'd probably loop it back to what we we're talking about. Like, I help them reach their full potential. And that was through helping them find their calling because then impossible things become possible. Welcome to Authentic Conversations. I'm your host, Ryan James Miller, and I believe the way to freedom, fulfillment, and success ultimately comes by living as the most authentic version of yourself. If you're ready to live the life you've dreamed of, you're in the right place. All right, what up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am here today with Dave Chase. Dave Chase is one of the founders of Health Rosetta. We'll get into a little bit of that. He is a staple in the healthcare, health insurance, and employee benefits world. He's the author of multiple books. Uh, he has made his way into many well-known publications, and he just said offline that he was recently at the White House uh, talking big things there, healthcare. So super exciting to hear all that stuff. And that's how so many people know him. Actually, probably a few of you are going to watch this or listen to this, and you're like, oh, yeah, I know Dave. I've heard of Dave. Uh, he is just a staple out there. But I wanted to have a different conversation with Dave today. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. But for now, Mr. Chase, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to the chat. And uh, yeah, I think we all talk enough about benefits. So I'm happy to talk about <laughs> other stuff. Yeah. So how many times do uh, do you get invited onto any kind of media resource, TV, podcast, and someone wants to talk to you about something other than healthcare? Not too often, not too often, uh, that's for sure. And it's fascinating, right? Because, I mean, th there's so much more to your life than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'd certainly like to think so. I, I hope my family believes that's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the question that I really love to kick things off with uh, on the podcast uh, is one that you're going to get to answer, uh, and it is, how would you best describe for yourself uh, masculinity and or manhood? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I mean, there's sort of the, the place I go to is just being a father, right? That's the first thing I think of. Um, and, you know, certainly being a, uh, hopefully a co-leader of the household, mm. um, and women bring a lot to the table men bring a lot to the table. Uh, and I think as far as what men, you know, we're, my wife and I, I think we're a good balance that way. Mm. Um, you know, it's a bit stereotypical, but she's more nurturing. I'm more like, you know, uh, I think a mom's instinct is to, um, do everything you possibly can for your child. Mm. And mine is, I want them to be able to do everything possible for themselves and then what they can't do, I'll jump in and hopefully um, being a, you know, manhood is about being a good leader and, you know, faith is very central to my life. Mm. And so I will never uh, achieve the outcome of trying to follow um, Christ's leadership. But like, I think my understanding is he was brought on earth to be an example of what a man should be. So like, that's the ultimate North star for me. That's good. That's good. And I, I really, I really appreciated. Uh, I, I, I like all of that. I, I love to hear as I talk to guys and everyone's kind of, kind of has a different flavor or a different idea of what that is. One thing that you said that really stood out to me was that you want to give your children the opportunity to go and do everything that they're capable of doing. Like you're providing this path for them. Uh, and I think that's super interesting because um, you know, we want to protect them. We want to provide for them, but really opening up this lane for them maybe is something that we don't 
focus on a, a, as much as we could as dads. I think sometimes it's just kind of like drop the hammer, do this, follow this path versus, versus really opening up and allowing them to be them. So I think that that's a really great uh, perspective to take. So what, what, what shaped for you that kind of understanding of becoming a man, getting married, having kids, like what influenced you <clears throat> as you were growing up along the way? Well, without question, I was one of the lucky ones, right? I had I grew up with two parents. They had a great marriage. Um, my dad was a wonderful example. It wasn't just the, you know, I bring home the bacon and, you know, whatever. That's the end of my job. He was very, very engaged. And, and in some ways, it's it sort of almost scared me to become a parent, right? We, I didn't rush into it because I, did, I didn't know if I could meet that bar. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as an adult, I realized he had a job that had quite a bit of travel, but he never, I can never remember a big event that he wasn't at. And I knew later on as an adult, well, he had to make some sacrifices and some career choices that, you know, maybe wasn't there. And he did travel a lot, but he was always there. Um, and that was really key. And he supported us in every facet of things we went into, right? You, you'd have some new job or new interest and suddenly in the mail, there'd be some articles out of some newspaper or magazine that would be related to that. And it was just that, you know, true unconditional support, which is, you know, that's pretty rare. I was really lucky that way. And, you know, maybe it gave me misplaced confidence, but like one of the sort of, you know, stories in our family lore, was uh, we lived in Japan for uh, a couple years when I was a kid, the end of grade school. And uh, so I was there in fourth grade. So I don't know, probably nine years old or something like that. And I'm the youngest of three. And uh, I went to this international school that was a long bus ride. I hated buses. And my brother who was four years older, was able to take the, the subway and train uh, to school. And I'm like, oh, can I just go with him? I hate buses. And, and um, it was like, there was a subway near us and then you transferred, came out of the ground, transfer to a train, another train, but, you know, and I was just supposed to go with my brother. Um, and he'd already done it maybe for a week or a few days and kind of had it dialed in. And like the first um, transfer, the train we were going to was right across the platform. And now in Tokyo, these trains come like every two or three minutes, but just by instinct, he just buzzed across the platform. I didn't, really, I wasn't that familiar with it. And like, literally the door hits him, like, as he's going in and then boom. And like the one job the older brother has, it's like, get his little brother to school. <laughs> um, and, you know, I saw him on the other side and he's like, oh man, like I screwed up. And I'm kind of like, okay, we have school uniforms in Japan. I'll just look for kids that have my school uniform and I'll just follow them. Like, I was like, I'm good. Right. And so, you know, next train gets off. Boom. I follow the kids. I get to school, you know, before school starts and they kind of out of my mind. And of course, you know, my brother like gets off of the next stop, comes back, brother's gone. Oh. Uh, and so he thought he was just dead. Um, but it just gives you an idea. Like, and I, that stuck with me, like with my own kids my daughter is the oldest of the two that we have and i mean for the time she was really little we'd go through airports and as long as we didn't have a tight connection i'd go okay how do we where's our next plane and you know like, dad why don't you just tell me where to go you know <laughs> and i'm like nope we got time and like oh you know and just frustrated you know with her crazy dad um <laughs> and then uh Fast forward, she ends up becoming a, a world-class figure skater and has travel and, 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 you know, was with a team and pretty much all the kids were like kind of lost and just followed her. And she was confident. She knew where to go. She was the first kid who knew how to order a Uber. That was like on a choir trip. Um, and, you know, it's, it, you know, I don't say the world's scary, but like, okay, she's a mm -hmm. attractive young blonde girl, right? I don't want her to be weak and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. To me, that's part of, I want her to just go out there and kick ass and, and do what she wants to do and, and uh, not be afraid of the world. And so 
long story, but I had that example, right? My yeah. dad was a world traveler and he was like, you know, and when she, my sister, um, who's the next one above me, um, who actually set uh, my wife and I up. So I'm forever indebted to her. But after undergrad, uh, you know, this is like, like late eighties. Um, she went and lived in South America. She wanted to come fluent in Spanish. Like wow. there's not that many dads or parents that let their, you know, 22 year old daughter go down in South America. And at that point, everyone's like, Oh, it's just all cocaine traffickers, <laughs> and all that. Right. And this was, you know, there was no internet, right. To communicate easily. Um, and, you know, she, had great travel. She traveled by land from Ecuador all the way to Argentina because she she had a um, uh, well, she learned fully learned Spanish in Ecuador. She'd done an undergrad thing there and then traveled by, by land to Argentina where she had a uh, internship at the embassy. Like that's a pretty gnarly trip, right? Yeah. You're going through Peru and Chile and and all of that. And there was some crazy stuff going on in Peru at the time. So to me, that was like, embrace the world. Don't be afraid of it. Mm. Be smart. Um, to me, that's, that's the kind of role model that I had and certainly wanted to be. I, I, I love that because, you know, when you, when you talked or when I hit on earlier accidentally by, uh, you know, saying that, you know, you were, kind of giving your children the opportunity to create these paths for themselves. I think a lot of parents and especially us as dads that are really protective, especially over our daughters. I'm, I'm that yeah. way. Um, it's like, okay, I want to do that, but how do I practically do that? And so not just in the story of how your dad did that for your sister, but when you said something as simple as we've got time in the airport, I'm going to exercise size some patience. Yes, I'm yeah. smart. Yes, I know where to go, but we're going to turn this into an opportunity to learn. I think there's such wisdom in that because we, I think, you know, like I know what to do. I'm going to show you the way that's how I'm going to lead and I'm going to charge, but that's not really teaching them as much as what you're doing is you're giving your kids the tools to, to figure things out for themselves. So then God forbid one time they get stuck in the middle of nowhere somewhere they can figure out how they get, you know, how to get home. I mean, most kids today can't find their way out of a paper bag because everything's been done for them. Yeah, exactly. And and that's the thing. You, you don't go from nothing to they're out in the real world, traveling around the world. Like you've got to do it step by step. So there were just like little things early on. Um, you know, it wasn't like we were trying to make a four-year-old to be an adult, yeah. but, you know, age appropriate. Mm -hmm. it, to me, it's like you, you, we had the safety net out in the distance, right? That would, you know, not going to let them run across the street or something stupid like that. But there's a lot of uh, low stakes um, things that, yeah. like you said, if you'd have some patience and to me, it's just a pay now or pay later. And I didn't want to have that stress and anxiety. And, and, you know, you know, the, you know, going back to my daughter, I mean, she had, she was actually in Milan at the start of COVID. Um, that was kind of a crazy scenario. Um, and, you know, we, of course, went through the various phases of how serious it was. But at first, I'm like, hey, make lemonades out of lemons, right? Like, maybe you're going to be doing your study abroad from the Amalfi Coast remote, you know, because we need to get out of Milan. You know, uh, little did we know at that point, it's going to go over the world. And it's going to shut yeah. down. But we're like, hey, like, get every last bit, you know, start, you know, a certain point, the handwriting is becoming on the wall a little bit. But we're like, hey. You can go to Florence and she's staying in a five-star place, paying youth hostel prices. Like she's FaceTiming us. And I'm like, are you in a freaking museum? Like <laughs> the art on the wall? And she's paying like, I don't know, 30 bucks a night or something for this amazing place. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we got her out when we needed to get her out. Yeah. Um, but hey, like, let's get every last minute, you know, out of this truck. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, it's been interesting as, I mean, I, I don't know you super well, but as I've gotten to know you, there, there are so many, um, there's so many layers, uh, to you that have been really interesting. And the one thing that I seem to catch from you when, when we last interacted uh, in person was, um, a, a much more, um, I, I don't know the right way to say this. There was just a lot more, uh, emotion and like, 
Um, I, I don't know. I guess because you professionally, man, you're fighting a hard fight. You've stood up against the giants of the industry. You have to be in some ways, I don't get this from you, but you have to be very aggressive in that, in that space. You're very structured. You're very intentional. You're very professional. You carry yourself like that. But I heard this like sensitive side that was very, uh, invested into your children. We, you know, we talked about you coaching track. And so where, how does that play a role for you? That, that, touchy feely side of you as a father, as a husband, maybe just, you know, even as a friend in the, in the world, because again, as men, this becomes something that's really hard. Um, we, we typically run away from those types of feelings. We don't typically talk about the lovey. It, it, it's more of like, no, we put up this hard exterior and we kind of let it go. So I, I kind of read into feeling like, oh man, there, there's a lot of depth to Dave. And so I, I think I'm right. Right. And if so, like, how does that play into kind of how you lead, how you befriend other people, even how you navigate the professional world? Yeah, I mean, there's a few different things that played into that, you know, some of it was because you're right, like, I like many men, particularly of my generation, you know, had that armor on and just like, I'm going to go kick ass and like, I mean, I, I'm not like in your face yelling type guy, but like, if you know me, I'm extremely competitive. Um, and, and so there was that part of me for sure. Um, that was just kind of the way it was done. But, uh, you know, unfortunately by the time I was 40, I'd had 10 friends, my age or younger die. And oh. that's a lot. Right. And that's a gut punch. And you try to get meaning out of that. Hmm. And and so I think that was definitely a big thread of like what really matters. Um, and and, you know, you just you can't help but have emotion around that. Hmm. Um, and so and the value of that and that that like you feel pretty helpless with the surviving friends and family, but like, at least if you can be there, you know, for them, that was a big part of it. Uh, another thing I would say that kind of the, the other big thing was as I studied, like there was this whole journey of how I even got to doing what I'm doing now. Once I overcame the barriers I put in front of myself to actually take that on. Cause it seemed like sort of a either delusional or hubristic thing to think you could take on healthcare. Mm -hmm. Once I got over that and I said, okay, well, how, you know, when you have these massive entrenched decades, uh, if not longer issues, how do you change that? And it really came into me studying social movements um, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, America becoming a country or women's suffrage or civil rights, mm -hmm. right? These type of things. And how did those folks like you know, some of those were still tackling? Um, and you know, one part of it is yeah, you have to reset expectations of something better and higher. Um, but then there was this thing I came across that um there's a professor, I think, in the Kennedy School at Stanford that had been involved in the civil rights movement, like um, uh, Marshall Gans is his name. And there's this concept of a public narrative. And it's the story of self, us now, like what's your story? And then what's our story? And then why does it matter now? And it's building a narrative around that. And the story of self, like that was... I, I kind of went into it as like, okay, I'm just throwing myself into, I'm going to take a leap of faith. And um, like, I didn't want to talk about me. I mean, that was one of the reasons I like track. Um, ultimately I'd had some, I mean, I was very much traditional baseball, football, basketball guy. And, you know, I was pretty good, but I wasn't Michael Jordan. So, you know, there was borderline stuff where um, there was still some politics and brown nosing and stuff like that that could come into play. And that wasn't about me. And I like that with track, just like stopwatch, you know, tape measure. Um, and, uh, and he just like, like, I like my results to do the talking, I guess. Mm -hmm. And like, people don't want to hear about me, right. That's not interesting. I don't want to hear about me. Um, 
And, but I kind of just threw myself into this thing. It was called a story Academy that actually a kind of protege of Marshall Gans put on this thing. They coach a lot of Ted talk and, and part of that, the story of self was this self-discovery process that you went through that literally like writing, you know, I was like, I hadn't like draw, you know, done drawing since that much since like, you know, first grade or something where you're like a little sketching out, like, you know, decade by decade, like what were moments in your life, these kind of seminal things. And, and ultimately they're trying to get at what made you who you are. And like, I knew I was a maniac and crazy about what I'm trying to do. I didn't know really know why. And I didn't really think people needed to care why, but I was like, okay, you know, these people are, are, they're on to something. I'm just going to throw myself into it. And, you know, I'm not even through the course and I'm speaking, I think it was some Milliman event. They had me speak at some events, um, not too far from you. In fact, I think the first one was down like Laguna beach. And I was like, okay, I, I, I'll do my own stilted, you know, version of what my story is and being vulnerable on that. Um, and it was palpable what the right. difference was in terms of the response, people coming after, like, I mean, people kind of give you the, oh, that was a nice talk, you know, and they're polite to you normally. Um, oh, but people are like, oh man, like that was powerful. And, you know, like, wow. oh, okay. Like I need to double down on that. Yeah. Um, not because it's about me, but if I can do that, I can connect with people in a way that ultimately, I mean, I'll, you know, do cartwheels if that convinces them to sort of join the movement. I don't care what it is. It just happens that the more, Ultimately, I think a sign of strength is vulnerability, which sounds odd, but I think that's the bottom line on it. That's so good. No, I mean, um, you know, you speaking to being a Christian, I mean, I, th I think, you know, that it speaks to that, you know, we hear in the Bible that, um, you know, uh, that the power of Christ is made perfect in our weakness. And I think that a lot of times vulnerability is seen as a weakness. And so we, we run from or refrain from the opportunities to be vulnerable uh, because of that fear of being weak. And yet when we lean into that so often, it demonstrates a strength, not only in the fact that it becomes strength in, in how it connects us to other people, which is such a benefit to that. But in us really exposing or becoming vulnerable to who we are, it allows people to see us who for who we really are often. And I think that there is such strength in that, that we can be confident in who we are, regardless of how people may perceive that. So I think that's so yeah. powerful. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, as I think about then, you know, you kind of alluded to how you uh, are leading and guiding your, your kids and, and some great practical tips there. So I know one thing, and, and this is what really caught me when we were talking last was you said that you really invested into track. I know you participated in that yourself, um, but you're still coaching today. No, no kids in the sport anymore. It's just something you're doing. And so why? Is that so important to you to, to stay invested into that? You know, it's big picture. Like a thing that motivates me is, is everybody should have the opportunity to reach their potential. Um, and, and so then when the coach asked me um, to do this, I hadn't thought about coaching. I mean, he found out that we both ran at the same college different times and by then he kind of figured out I wasn't just some insane, you know, sports parent, you know? Um, and, and he asked me, I'm like, man, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a commitment, but it was like, okay. I mean, there was a personal benefit of getting to be around my son and around his friends. And that was great. Um, but the biggest thing candidly was, um, you know, after my parents, my high school track and cross country coach was the biggest influence in my life up until my wife. Um, and there's parts of like how I set goals, how I mentally prepare for stressful things that I got in that. And I thought, gosh, this is sort of the whatever, I guess there's pay it forward, pay it 
backward or whatever, like this is payback for um, this. And that if I can, you know, not everybody's as lucky as me in terms of having, you know, great parents and great examples. And um, if I can be that, you know, in terms of help, I'm not saying I'm their parent, um, but you can do things as a coach. You can't as a parent. Right. There's there's things that will go in one ear and out the other when they're coming from the parent um, and then a coach, they'll hear it. Yeah. Um, and and so I just like eh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, and, you know, I'll, I got hooked pretty quickly. Right. And, and that I saw some things in some kids and one in particular that first season. And I'm like, hey, how about we try uh, McKenna in this event, I think she could, you know, I think that might be a real fit for her. And she'd not done running before. Um, and, and, you know, long story short, like four weeks later, she's on the podium at state and her points were the difference between, um, us being second state and winning state. And it was his first state championship ever for this coach that I work with wow. like 30 years. And so like, don't get me wrong. I love the comp competition too, but um, seeing like, oh, I said this, you know, and, and I, you know, it was like in that, it was a kind of crash course. I'm just going to give her a little bit, like you can't overwhelm somebody with too much. And, and she was a coachable kid. So that helped a lot. Um, and just one example, but there was other ones and I was like, oh, I did that. And there's like, boom, she executes like, whoa, like, you know, literally, you know, I, I was coming into the, the, in between the prelims and the finals for the state qualifier. I'm like, man, she could actually make it to state. It could be close. We're in the most competitive district. Okay. I kind of looked, found this video and learned like how to dip at the tape. Um, and, and she did it and made wow. it to state by two hundredths of a second, just Whoa. executed it flawlessly. And I was like, that was the difference. And she did the same thing to make it to the finals. Um, I think got a three hundreds of a second. She was just like, and we're just, and seeing that feedback loop, mm -hmm. um, of like, wow, I can, you know, say this and they listen and then they go execute and they're not going to always succeed, but they're go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't care if the kid makes it to state, but that's one of the nice things about a sport like that is you, you get, you know, uh, hundredth of a second faster, that's still personal best, no matter yeah. where you are in the pack. And, you know, our cross country season, we had some kid that I, in a 5k, which isn't that long, he improved his time 11 minutes or something Whoa. like that. It was crazy. Um, and he was, you know, ended up becoming the most, you know, inspirational member of the team, you know, and he didn't wow. go to, he didn't go to state, but to yep. see that and to see him get confidence in his ability to take on the world. And that's where, you know, I'll get into the technical stuff on the coaching, but I'm there to be a life coach, you know, of, Hey, like, here's how this connects with your life, right? We've got to meet today and I talk a little about how you, you know, you put yourself to a test and you're going to like in an endurance sport, there's pain. I was like, well, sorry to break the news. You're going to have physical and mental pain in the future. Um, and I want you to be able to deal with that well and be able to come back to this and this is the ability to test yourself and yeah we love to win races we love to have prs in the grand scheme of thing it doesn't matter but put yourself to the test now that when that comes um and i mean just a little example like to you know connect it with some of the work stuff like the um the the opening night of the first health rosetta summit um my dad died that you know in the early morning of that. Yeah. And I was probably not unrelated diagnosed with shingles during the opening party from one of the docs. And that's a pretty painful thing too. And, and so fortunately I had a great team around me and, you know, I muscled through it to the best I could, but I was definitely drawn on how to manage pain. Right. And, and sort of how to, you know, I didn't want to just get jacked on, you know, a bunch of medications and, and all of that. Um, and so that was helpful, like how you breathe deep and, you know, push away stuff, da, da, da. Right. So there's just different ways where you can connect stuff like, yeah, we're going to do this in this workout or in this race, but this is, here's how it connects with life.
So good. One of the things that I, I, I take from that and I really appreciate is I feel like one of the reasons our country is in the place that it's in today, maybe our world is in the place that it's in today, is because men have been sitting on the sidelines um, watching as the moms are running the show at home and they're kind of just sitting back doing nothing. Or even worse is I understand that you know, a lot of, a lot of men are driven to be successful professionally, but they, they, they're so deep into it that they have no time to invest into any other aspect of their marriage, of their children, um, of sport like that. And here you are giving a wonderful example of, I mean, obviously you had to be passionate about, you know, the sport or you wouldn't have wanted to do it yeah. and you were good at it. And so that was helpful too, but it was like back to maybe even, you know, uncovering kind of more of your story. And like, you know, the, the more you, you know, who you are, the easier it is to align your passions with these, this purpose that you feel you're called to, which is to be able to, again, like this theme that seems to be running over and over is really kind of draw people into into the path that that is is destined for them and you're coaching them through that and i just feel like more guys need to to be attentive to the needs of the world and that doesn't necessarily mean traveling across the world to go to a third world country to be going on a mission trip though it may be that yeah. but it's like there's just needs in our community everywhere and you've just demonstrated a wonderful example of being so impactful. Yes. To win championships or yes, to win races, which is great, but you're changing people's lives. And, and I think that that just goes unconsidered or under considered because so many men are focused either on just pure laziness, which happens sometimes, or they're just so uber focused on just kind of this one aspect of, I want to be successful professionally because that's what's measured. And so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And, and that's where, if you look at what I'm doing now professionally, one of the two most fulfilling aspects of it is <clears throat> getting, and it, it relates to your point of getting people through this journey of, yeah, most of the time it's better to have a job than not have a job, but it's better to have a career, you know, once you're competent than a job, but way better than a career is having a calling. And when, and that's when you figure out why you were put here. And part of the problem is if you're just there to make money, it sucks the life out of you. And so, yes, I'm working super hard, but when it's a calling, you know, it's the cliche, you don't work a day in your life, you know, when you're, you know, you know, you enjoy it. And when you, and, and it, it took me a long time to figure out what that calling is, but yeah, I'm working my tail off and it's not like it's unbroken string of successes by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not sucking the life out of me so that I can then go to the track and I'm not sitting there thinking about, you know, reference based pricing, you know, <laughs> while I've got to stop watching my hand, I can be present there. And it's true with the family, you know, too. And it's also where early in my career, it was very much about compartmentalization. It was like, there's my career. I'm going to go work up that corporate ladder as fast as possible. And I was getting some of my competitive juices out there and I can play that game pretty well. Um, but at a certain point, it's like, yeah, that's, you know, and through the deaths of my friend, I learned that it's kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. um, and then to where, oh, wow, when you can actually blend who you are and what you do, mm -hmm. then it's energizing. And like, I can't really fathom the R world word retirement. It's like, why would I do that? Yeah. Um, and I've known you know, I met Albert Starr, you know, he was the inventor of the artificial heart valve, you know, when he was, I think he was 87 when I met like that guy is going full bore and he's sharp as attack and enjoying it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a good model. It doesn't mean I can't enjoy my kids and life and travel and track and all that along the way. Cause it's also, guess what, when you try to tackle something this hard, um, it's going to keep me off the streets the rest of my life. Like it's going to be a long haul, even though we're making a lot of impact, but like, Hey, we're, you know, impacting single digit millions and there's 330 million or whatever people in the U S and 
there's 8 billion or whatever in the world, like I'll be busy for a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and hopefully if I've done my job, well, you've, I've infected a bunch of people mm-hmm. like, you know, you take somebody like a Bryce Heinbaugh, he's gone through that. Yeah. But when I met him, he was probably at the career stage. He had a good practice, right? I'd like to think I, and I think you'd find out if you talked to him, I infected him so that he found his calling. And that guy is a man on the mission and loving it. His business is going great too, by the way. Um, like when you see people that, that sort of light coming into their eyes, that twinkle and fire, it's like, yeah. boom, watch out. Um, yeah. That's super fulfilling to see that and see like I played some small role in that. Yeah. Like, I want more of that drug. Yeah. That, you know, it's so funny that you say that. I, I've heard very few people articulate it that way, but um, like I, I, I did my fair share of drugs in high school and uh, shortly thereafter and experienced some pretty good highs from time to time. Um, one of the greatest highs I get now is just that as, you know, as I coach people and I get the opportunity to see inside of them, a lot of times the things they can't completely see inside of themselves, yeah. bring that to, to the surface and then have them live into that through the roles that they're called to, or to connect that to a, to an all out passion that they have. Uh, and, and you just see that switch flip but but just that they brighten up so much and it is just one of the greatest feelings to to know that it happens and then like you said you know even if it's just a fraction of a percent of impact or effect you've had on that person it makes you feel so good and you know it it allows me to endure all of the bullshit that i deal with all around that (laughs) right right and it might just be yeah you're the one who just like nudge them over that hill um but you need that like every bit matters yeah, that's so true. Okay, so landing the plane, yeah. um, I, I ask this in a variety of different ways, but I think because you have such an impact, I mean, clearly you're having an impact in your family, you're having an impact in the uh, in the individuals and the teams that you're coaching, you're having a massive impact in healthcare, which is ultimately impacting uh, millions and millions of people in the United States. Um, uh, so for you, I'm interested to know, how do you want, people, what would you really want people to say about Dave, the man? Like what, what, what is it that you want people to say about you? Um, now, not when you die, like right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, my flip answer is I don't, I don't, um, that doesn't animate me. Like, I don't care if they think about, you know, me, I just care about, you know, and to me, like, you know, the, the second most, um, translated book, right. Is the purpose driven light and starts with, it's not about you. Yeah. Um, but I guess it would, I'd probably loop it back to what we we're talking about. Like I help them reach their full potential. And that was through helping them find their calling because then impossible things become possible. Um, so I think it's that right. It is kind of that coach facet of, yeah. Um, being that maybe I had the the key that I helped them unlock something in them that they didn't know was possible. Um, and that's, you know, and there's a lot of different flavors of that. That's probably where my head would go on that is just unlocking their potential. I love that. Dave, Thank you. Um, I mean, you know, we've crossed paths many a different times, you know, haven't, I think this is probably the longest conversation we've ever had all at once. And so if nothing else, I mean, this was very positively impactful on me. I appreciate hearing more of your story and who you are as a human being, but I know that this is going to have such an impact on other people. So, so really, really, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to be able to do this. Yeah, no, I was really looking forward to this. I had this marked up and we scheduled it out probably a month ago. I was like, yeah, this will be like, unlike anything I've done before in terms of podcasts. And um, I've just gotten more comfortable with being uncomfortable and just yeah. kind of throwing myself into situations. So thanks for our teeing that up and uh, a great chat. No, I'm, I'm always down for more. Thank you.
And for everybody listening, um, if you're watching or listening and you know Dave, uh, you know some facet of this, but I would I would challenge you to dig deeper into this side of him because I think that how you're interacting with him professionally will only grow as the result of how you know him personally. And outside of that, you're like, who is this guy? Go go check him out. We'll put his contact information into the show notes. Uh, he wrote a book years ago. The CEO's Guide to Restoring the American Dream was the first time I ever found out about Dave. I was in the healthcare world. It was deeply impactful the way that he really cared about healthcare. Um, but beyond that, you can hear how he is as a human being, as a husband, as a father. So connect with him, uh, check him out, and engage with him. You won't be sorry. If you have any questions for me, you know where to find me. Feedback is always appreciated. In in the meantime, be you, be happy, be authentic. Thanks guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Authentic Conversations. If you are ready to live the life you've dreamed of, I'm here to help. Head to ryanjamesmiller.com slash podcast to begin your journey. And if this episode impacted you in any way, pay it forward by sharing it with someone you know. I'm Ryan James Miller, and I'll see you next time on Authentic Conversations.